So forgive me if I um, use some pre-prepared remarks. Uh, when I left the Royal Air Force in 1999 as an engineer officer, uh, the software industry, the entrepreneurial world, was all in a state of boom. By the time I'd done my master's degree, we'd had a bust. And you're, some of you in this room are old enough like me to remember it. And I wondered why had all the world been herded into the same set of errors? A friend handed me Ludwig von Mises' uh, Causes of the Economic Crisis uh, and other essays before and after the Great Depression. And so I started following the Austrian school. Now, I've been in uh, Parliament for 11 years. I think I can say to you that I'm the only Austrian school classical liberal in Parliament. <laughs> Uh, there are not. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. There's just the one of me, and I think I can fairly say that you'll find Austrian school uh, ideas on the record, thanks to me. So today, as a practical politician, and of course I am a practical politician elected to represent Wickham, you know the challenge for me is to answer the question of whether Mises' critique matters now. Um, few can seriously suggest that the last few years have been a, a crisis of laissez-faire. I mean, does anyone really think that the government has intervened too little, spent too little, taxed too little? With my goodness, is this security? or have you, this, is a, <laughs> this is the thought police have come for me. You know, this has not been a crisis of, of laissez-faire. I mean, the truth is that ministers' default response, I have been a minister, ministers' default response uh, to any problem is yet more interventionism. So the, the dominant mindset amongst politicians and policymakers is interventionism. They seem incapable of asking the question of whether unwanted consequences from their previous state action have uh, caused the problems that they're complaining about. They seem to see only market failures to be remedied by more, yet more state intervention. People tend to blame ministerial incompetence or bad faith. I have to say to you, as far as I can see, ministers are no more or less competent than anybody else, no more or less uh, acting in bad faith. In fact, actually, I have great confidence in my colleagues in ministerial office that they're doing their very best. The question that faces them and faces us is whether they couldn't do things by, better by leaving uh, problems to the forces of social cooperation. Now, measures are typically justified for the benefit of the poor and the vulnerable, typically supported by vested interests. They can be seen everywhere. And to withdraw an intervention is seen as callous, whether to implement something new is seen as necessary and overdue. Those of you who have read Mises' Bureaucracy will know that freed of the disciplines of profit and loss, state spending departments pursue status through the number of employees that they have in their budget. So with all this in mind, the direc direction of travel is, is very clear. We heard from Jeff about the problem of the abundance of money. Of course, spending departments take for granted that money is abundant. And so, you know, it's hard, it's hard therefore, to disagree with the economist David B. Smith, who provided a paper to Treasury Committee at my request, which concluded uh, this. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that the UK was nudging up against the historic upper limits of taxable capacity and sustainable government spending, even before the COVID-19 virus struck. And that's the fundamental problem. We have been living beyond our means for a very, very long time. We've made promises that can't be kept, and ultimately the state has funded them by debasing the currency. This is a problem we were warned about by great luminaries like Alan Greenspan. So an enormous crisis is coming, in my view. If we were to look at how the government in the UK has funded the response to coronavirus, do you think that they borrowed the money from savers? Well, no. Our own Office for Budget Responsibility makes very clear that roughly the same quantity of bonds were bought by the Bank of England from the secondary market as the government issued. In other words, the spending, the enormous spending we've had through coronavirus has been funded through money creation. The horror of it for me, as a practical politician, as well as an Austrian school classical liberal, is I've had to support my constituents being looked after in the course of this pandemic. I couldn't possibly oppose the furlough scheme, for example. I'll just leave that out there. If we get to Q&A, uh, we'll see what you think about that. We've ended up with, in a position where it now takes an extraordinary level of economic education to believe that this economy, propped up as it is by money creation and ultra-cheap credit, can be in any way sustainable. And again, as somebody who's practically elected, I see what is an astonishing position in the context of worldwide and UK monetary history, and I wonder how much longer it can go on.
We find economists are content with our present high debt levels, pointing to the historically low cost of debt servicing. One wonders how, many, how so many august people can confuse cause and effect simply because the price under consideration is an interest rate and the supplier of the relevant commodity, money, is able to produce it costlessly at will. So this is where I wrap my mark remarks up. As Austrians, we face an alien but entrenched paradigm amongst those who govern our lives. And make no mistake, they do have power. I listened very carefully to Jeff, and I'm afraid I fear we're much more likely to get central bank digital currency, which I have described on the record as totalitarian finance, much more likely to get that than we are to see uh, Bitcoin become a common medium of exchange. And I think the quality of all our lives in the medium and long run relies on us understanding these points and then taking up our task of defending liberty with a great spirit of buoyancy and hope. We're never going to attract people to our position by being downbeat, downcast, by despairing or being angry. So I suppose my great appeal to you is to understand that from the perspective of the Austrian school, the ideas which are failing right now are not our ideas. Of course they're not. They're the ideas of statism. Much that Mises foresaw and other Austrians is coming to pass. Whatever happens in the months and years ahead, we've got to keep smiles on our faces, keep going, keep articulating why the crisis is happening and show people a better way. So with that, thanks very much. I've been astonished just how few people know anything about how money's created. Well, I, I think it's unquestionable. Mr. Steve Baker. The methods of money production in society today are profoundly corrupting in ways which would matter to everyone if they were clearly understood. Money is created out of thin air when banks write a loan. Uh, central banks create digital money. They print, so to speak, digital money. You know, it's clear in the first instance that lowering interest rates raises asset values. If you're an asset holder, uh, these low interest rates tend to make you wealthier. If you're a wage earner and not an asset holder, you uh, fall behind. We're on a road to greater inequality. Remember, central banks are central planners. Well, the whole problem with the way that we organize our, our money supply is we don't have a proper market pricing in it. You lose the most important signal in the economy in terms of where capital should be allocated. I think people want sound money. Um, they don't like to see prices rising all the time. So the, uh, the chapter that I'm discussing today is, is the chapter that Steve and I have written for a book to be published next year by Springer on the Austrian school. And actually, much of this research, excellent research, in fact, was done by Harry, Harry Richer, who's here as well, Steve's assistant. And so this book by Springer uh, has invited scholars from around the world to each write chapters on different themes relating to the Austrian school. And Springer did their previous Austrian school book like this uh, in 2018. And for that one, I did the chapter on blockchain and then presented that here. But this is actually going to be slightly different. In fact, the way we've approached this chapter is different from much of modern academia. So we've really discussed some experiences of central banks and the political sphere and also institutions such as the IMF and so on. And over the last few years, we've organized quite a few seminars and events on the Austrian School, including at the Bank of England, uh, the OECD, and in the European Parliament and elsewhere. So one of the key things which I go through is really whether it's possible for the Austrian School to gain influence in these types of institutions. As many of you will be aware, Hayekian ideas, 
have gained a lot of followers among the public since the 2008 financial crisis. But really still at this point, its influence in policymaking circles is still pretty limited at best. So when we view the last generation or so from a Hayekian perspective, the, our position on, on the monetary developments is fairly clear, which is that from the early 1980s onwards, we've had a series of phases of lower and lower interest rates, which have created larger and larger debt bubbles. So if we take the US, for example, first you had the bubbles of the 1980s, like the savings and loans bubbles. Then when that burst at the end of the decade, Alan Greenspan then implemented the 3% interest rates, the lowest interest rates for generations. And then following that, uh, several iterations of the Greenspan put. And that, of course, accumulated to create the dot-com bubble. Then when that burst in 2000, the Federal Reserve then implemented even lower interest rates of 1%, which then went on to create an even larger bubble, the housing bubble. Uh, then when that burst in 2008, the response has been more than a dozen years now of 0% or near 0% interest rates, and of course in some cases even negative interest rates, which has gone on to create an even larger bubble than was present in 2008. In fact, what we have now is what one researcher at the BIS called a multivariate bubble, but what's also been called the everything bubble. That is, just about every asset class at this point has been artificially inflated by 0% interest rates and QE and other more exotic forms of monetary policy. And Andy Haldane, who was mentioned earlier, who was until recently the chief economist at the Bank of England, he noted at Treasury Select Committee in 2017 that the financial crisis was a very significant forecasting error. The large rise in levels of leverage in the banking system was there for everyone to see, and they sowed the seeds of the crisis. There was a degree of collective amnesia or oversight. Yet in 2007, the total amount of global aggregate debt worldwide was around 150 to 160 trillion dollars, already the largest debt bubble in history by some margin. But after more than a decade of 0% interest rates, global aggregate debt is now more than 280 trillion dollars. But as well as the massive increases in debt, what we've seen steady falls in the quality of bonds with each phase of lower and lower interest rates. And we've also seen increases in the proportion of zombie companies as well. So this, uh, the, the effects of the, these different phases of lower and lower interest rates have really pervaded the economy. And we've reached a point where, for much of the economics establishment, the solution to every problem is more expansionary monetary policy, which then creates larger and larger bubbles and more and more malinvestment. So the question then is really, how can we actually influence the establishment. So we, as I mentioned at the Cobden Centre, we've done a number of events, the Bank of England, the OECD, quite a few venues, the European Parliament. And one of the things is many of the traditional things discussed in the Austrian school, so for instance, the gold standard, or even fractional reserve banking, are often pretty unhelpful. What we found to be one of the most useful approaches is as much as possible to tie Austrian school ideas to traditional economics. So as we know, when someone studies an economics degree in their first year as an undergraduate, they study microeconomics and they spend much of their time drawing graphs showing the effects of price fixing and producing equations showing that when politicians and bureaucrats set prices, you end up with food shortages, shortages of other products and so on and so on. Yet an economics student then goes on to study macroeconomics, where they start drawing ISLM curves and producing equations to show how central banks setting interest rates will stimulate the economy and bring the economy out of recession. So, so much of what we've done is really, is really tying these ideas together. Again, so I think the key for us is to equate monetary policy to other forms of price fixing. As we know, Price fixing has failed effectively in just about every single area in which it's been tried, not just over the last few decades, but even over thousands of years, even going back to ancient Rome and before that. 
In the 1970s, of course, there was price fixing in many different countries. In Britain, we had uh, politicians and civil servants setting prices in, in across much of the economy, and it was, of course, a total farce. But I suspect the final area where this philosophy will be shown to fail will be in central banks setting interest rates. But unfortunately, I suspect for this bubble, we're beyond the point of no return now in terms of the size of the bubble. It's going to be very painful when it bursts. So we've had questions before. The Cobbler said, why do you bother even trying to influence the establishment with some of these Austrian school ideas? And this has been touched on previously. When this bubble does burst, I suspect the only place for the establishment to go will be negative interest rates. And the way to implement that is with a central bank digital currency. That's actually what I gave my talk on here uh, two years ago, if you want to uh, learn more about that. So it'll be the ultimate case of central planning begetting more central planning. So yes, this, uh, this chapter will be, will be in the Springer book next year on the Austrian school. So I encourage, encourage you all to, to check that out when it's released. Thank you. I think we have time for one question. And uh, first, I will just ask this film you showed, where can we see the book? It's from Springer, but when we can we see and where can we see the film? Please. So, so, Clive, I mean, we're, gonna, we, we're, we're looking at uh, routes for distribution for next year. So. It'll be on social media everywhere. If you want yeah. one thing you can do, follow me on Twitter. I'll make sure you see it. Great, great. One short question, please. Is there someone who wants to? Sir. Yes. Yes. I would suspect bonds. Uh, OK, repeating it. Um, which asset class do you think will burst first in this new bubble that's developing that you're talking about? I suspect bonds because if you look at equity prices, it's quite extraordinary the extent to which they've been inflated. And, we, and they can effectively keep them inflated for quite a long time. Whereas if you look at bonds, it's really the quality of the bonds. So the OECD have done brilliant research. And you see with each wave of lower and lower interest rates, over the last 40 years, you see the quality of bonds essentially following the same pattern. And remember, that's now held in pension funds and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah and one, you, you had a short answer yeah, to, also. To answer your question, I think with inflation coming in and with governments so reliant on the bond markets and QE, when the, when the Bank of England and other central banks take a QE and raise interest rates, it's going to cause the most terrible panic in bond markets. That's my view. I might be wrong. I'd love to be wrong. But I suppose tying together what i would said and what Max has said, my challenge and, and, and sort of my demand of all of you is that we pick up this task of advancing freedom with hope in our hearts because it's the only choice we've got. But I, I, hopefully we're all wrong. Hopefully we're all wrong and central planning is a fantastic idea and none of this is going to go wrong. <laughs> but I don't believe that's right. I think everybody is here because they know that some asset class is going to burst, it's probably going to be bonds and the government's going to panic. So, thank you very much. Okay. So I think we've got that one.